Hello everyone, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to MSP lecture series on transmetallic chemistry. This is the last but one lecture. So, in this lecture let me give little bit information about uh, few multinuclear NMR spectra and how to interpret the spectra and also brief information about IR spectroscopy. So, in my next lecture I shall try to conclude and summarize whatever the 59 lectures I gave covering most of the aspects revolving around coordination compounds and to an extent organometallic compounds. So, now I have given a few molecules here sketch the 19F NMR spectrum of PF5. If a question like this is asked, one thing you should know if the information is not given about the dynamic process or it is not given information or it does not have any information whether the molecule is static or dynamic with fractionality and of course, PF5 is known for switching their equatorial and axial PF bonds via Berry pseudo rotation. But however, in if the question does not explicitly say about the molecule, we should understand that fractionality is there in it. In that case what happens all 5 will look almost identical with respect to NMR time scale. As a result what happens if you look into 19F NMR spectrum, it should show simply a doublet. All 5 will be equivalent, they will be coupled with one phosphorus. In my previous lecture, I was telling about uh, remembering n plus 1 rule uh, to identify number of lines in a splitting pattern. But I would say instead of this one, it is better if you use 2 n i plus 1 rule. I is the nuclear spin of the interacting nucleus and also n is number of equivalent nuclei. For example, if CH3, CH2, OH is there and if you want to know of course, you just leave this one. If you consider CH3 how it is splitting this one, so here 2 into 3 into half plus 1 it goes 4 lines. So, this will give 4 lines for this one. So, it looks like, like this and then for this one it is 2 into 2 into half plus 1 equals 3. So, this will give 3. So, I think this is better to go with this one. This, this one would tell you the number of lines the splitting pattern irrespective of number of equivalent nuclei and also the type of nucleus we are using whether i equals half i equals 3 by 2 it is applicable for uh, all type of uh, nuclei and also better to use this one rather than using this one do not use this one. Okay, now, let us look into so 19F NMR would show a doublet, but on the other hand you should remember if they are assuming it is a static molecule in that case what happens two axial are different from three in the plane. So, that means first axial will split by PF coupling to give a doublet and then doublet each line will be split into a quadrate because of three in the plane. On the other hand three in the plane would first split by phosphorus to a doublet and each line in the doublet will be split into a triplet because of this one. So, if time permits I shall tell you about that one, but you should be able to work out. So, now uh, we have this molecule, this molecule, this molecule is here and of course, this is NMR active, this is NMR active. Now, the question is asked about this one. So, 195 platinum, 195 platinum when the question is asked, you should not worry about abundance because we are looking into the NMR nuclei that itself. So, in this case now we have to see this platinum is one bond apart from P1 and two bond apart from P2. Now, first it will be split into a doublet and then each line will be further split into a doublet. So, this coupling would say this is for 195 Pt platinum. So, this would say 1 J Pt P1 and then this one or this one would say 2 J Pt P2. So, that means spectrum will look, would look like something like this. For this one I have given in the next slide. So, you can see here and of course, this is how it looks you know 19195 platinum NMR and if you just look into this molecule here, we have two phosphorus one is trivalent, one is pentavalent. So, they are magnetical and chemically non-equivalent. So, they couple each other with a large coupling constant and now we have selenium is there and this selenium will couple to this one as well this one, but if the selenium NMR is asked here, then you can see here these are the 
possible isotopes out of which only one is NMR active uh, 77 selenium I equals half that means out of 100 molecules if you consider out of that one 77.65 let us say 7 molecules are NMR active remaining to 63 are NMR inactive that means basically but when we look into 77 NMR you have to consider it is very similar to here. So now first this one will be coupled with this one this is something like this and then each will be split by this second this due to 2J selenium phosphorus coupling and this is how the spectrum would look like this coupling is this one and this coupling or this coupling is 1J PSC. So this is how you should be able to write for other nucleus. But only thing is when I am looking into 31P NMR, if I look into 31P NMR of this one, we have two signals in this case. First let us say this one is coupled with this one, it gives a doublet. This is due to 1J PP coupling. If I put P1 and P2, P1 and P2 and now uh, P1 will be coupled with this small coupling will be there ok. So, this is your 2J PSC coupling, 2J PSC coupling this one also. So, it looks like and other one now this one also will show very similar to that one, but it may show larger coupling. So, now how it looks like the first this is coupled with so now it is not 100 percent as a result what would happen is first you get something like this a doublet and each doublet will be further split into small this one will be something like this and this will be something like this. So, this is your PSC coupling, but when you take this one it will also show a doublet, but here it will show a larger coupling. So, larger coupling how it shows something like this depending upon how much selenium selenium coupling it would be splitting like this. So, you should see that one I will show you few more examples. Now let us look into this molecule here. So here we have two phosphorus one is bonded directly to uh, rhodium other one is two bond apart. Now let us look into first A here first this one will be coupled with rhodium this rhodium coupling is larger 103 rhodium 103 rhodium is I equals half and 100 percent abundant. So first you get a line like this and then this is your 1J rhodium phosphorus coupling rhodium phosphorus coupling and now this will be further split by this one to triplet this should triplet because PF coupling. So, each one this is your PF coupling triplet and now this each line will be split into a doublet because of 1 to 2 J PP coupling. So, now it looks like that. So, basically a doublet a triplet and a triplet each line will be a doublet. So, that means a doublet of triplets doublet of triplets of doublet. So, this is how it is doublet of triplets of doublets doublet of triplets of doublets this is how you you mention the spectrum. In the same way if you go for PB here first this would be coupled with say rhodium phosphorus 2J coupling will be there or if PP coupling is more that would be there here PP coupling would be more here. So, 2J PP coupling this one will be little less and this is your 2J rhodium phosphorus coupling and then this will be further split by fluorine on this one. So, this this smaller coupling is then this is called doublet of doublets of triplets ok. You should be able to distinguish and interpret properly. So, first phosphorus if you consider this one this is coupled with rhodium because the coupling is larger about 250 hertz and then each line of this one a doublet will be split by triplet because of PF coupling PF coupling will be less in magnitude compared to rhodium phosphorus uh, 1J coupling and then each line will be further split into PP coupling. So, this is how you can see the coupling tree you can write like this then one can write a spectrum like this. So, two are there doublet of triplets of doublets. So, now uh, when you consider this molecule here you simply if somebody asks you to sketch 14 in NMR for this one we have three options ok, three options are there. What are those? If you see this hydrogen is one bond apart, these two phosphorus are one bond apart, you do not know the magnitude of NP coupling and NH coupling. So, in this case we have to see whether PN coupling can be larger than NH coupling one case or PN coupling will be smaller than NH coupling or both of them can be identical. In that case first let us look into PN coupling is larger, first in that case what happens? Uh, it will first triplet into a triplet 
because P n coupling is larger triplet and then each one will be split into a doublet like this. So, this is one second option is a P n coupling is smaller than N H coupling, N H coupling is then it will first give a doublet due to N H coupling and then each one will be split into uh, triplet 1 is to 2 is to 1. So, the spectrum will be something like this and in this case it will be in the third case both are identical the magnitude is so that means basically this is interacting with the three identical nuclei although they are of different elements. So, now how to say again use 2 n i plus 1 rule i equals half here. So, 2 into so 3 are there 3 into half 4 lines. So, what you get is 4 lines in third case. So, first it will split into something like this then it will be 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. So, these 3 conditions are there and you should see what condition matches which one you should know. Uh, now, let us look into the most common question we come across about boron hydride sodium borohydride if you take anion here BH4 anion. So, the spectrum is shown here this is 1 H NMR spectrum. Now, we have to explain why these lines are 4 lines are equivalent and also we have some lines here. Now, we should remember boron consists of 2 isotopes 10 boron with I equals uh, 3 and then 11 boron I equals 3 by 2. So, now you should see if 2 Ni plus 1 rule you should apply for this one this is 80 percent that means out of 100 molecules 80 molecules have 11 boron and 20 molecules have 10 boron. So, first we should write for 80 now 2 into only 1 boron is there, but spin is 3 by 2 plus 1. So, you should give 4 lines of equal intensity something like this. So, this is for 10 11 boron H coupling 4 lines and this this separation is identical this is approximately 80 hertz this is equals 80 hertz. Now, you should remember now we have 20 percent if this is 80 percent then 20 percent intensity will be for this one 20 molecules they have 10 boron if 10 boron I equals 3. So, 2 into only 1 boron is there 1 into 3 plus 1. So, here it is 7. So, there should be 7 lines. These 7 lines you can see here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They will be essentially 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 something like this and then each separation is identical. This separation is 10 boron H coupling. So, this is how you can interpret and you can also explain why the smaller lines are this. It is overlapping of both because when you look into boron NMR it will account for 10 boron as well as 11 boron. 11 boron out of 100 molecules, molecules with 11 boron are 80 and 10 boron are 20. So, if you look into intensity of this one, if it is 80 say each one is 20 intensity and then here 10 means uh, 10 by 6 you can see how much it is about 1.5 intensity or something at the end both of them should be a match 100 percent. So, this is how one can interpret. Now, one more question the element lead has several naturally occurring isotopes including all these things of these isotopes only 207 has a non-zero nuclear spin I equals half what would you expect to observe for 1 H NMR spectrum of tetramethyl lead ok given the 2 J coupling is 60 hertz. So, then how do you explain this one the question is very simple we have given here. So, now it is 1 H NMR spectrum. So, that means if you just look into all isotopes except for 22 percent, 22 percent is NMR active I equals half other you can consider 78 percent NMR I equals you can ignore. So, that means basically we have 100 molecules uh, 22 molecules have I equals half 207 lead others are we should not worry that means those 78 percent will first show a singlet and then this 22 percent what happened this will be split into doublet and then like equidistance from this one these are called satellite peaks these are and now it is uh, this is 11 percent this is 11 percent this will be 78 percent if you look into the intensity and now this separation is called 1 J P B H coupling this is equal 60 hertz. So, this is what the, uh, given something like this, this is how the spectrum looks like. So, now let us look into this one, this is very interesting. First, let me write 31 PNMR and let me write the structure of the molecule quickly N and remember this is 15 N is 100 percent, it is 15 N 
So now we yes, say we H. You see something like this. All are in NMR active. So something like this. This one is strongly coupled with uh, two fluorine atoms. First, it should give a triplet. So let me write little bigger because a lot of coupling is going to come here. So triplet. This is your PF coupling. PF coupling, same triplet, and now this is coupled with N, a doublet. So doublet. Each one is a doublet. This is done. This is your uh, PN coupling. Now this H coupling. So H coupling will come another doublet. Doublet. This is your NH coupling. And now these three are there. These three will also couple. Each one will be split into a quadrate. And intensity will be one is to three is to three is to one. So you should be able to sketch this spectrum beautifully. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 into 2, 48 lines will be there totally. So then you can say triplet of doublets of doublets of quadrates. This is how the NMR would look like. You can see here. This is how it looks like. And this is how you can interpret and do it. Try, try for 15N, also 1H NMR also you should try. This is very interesting. Just look into this molecule here. This PPR far away. And then if you see here, it will show single peak for both the phosphorus atom, one is on nitrogen, one is on oxygen. They do not have any coupling because they are far away from each other. But in the complex, now they are two bond apart because of platinum chelation. Now they can show PP coupling. Now this small separation is PP coupling. And now platinum again, if you consider platinum, 34 percent of platinum is NMR active I equals half, that is 195 platinum. Rest is 66 is uh, we should not worry and 0, 196 platinum. So that means basically if I have 100 molecules, okay, so each one would show a doublet, PP coupling this also shows a doublet. Now they will show satellite peak due to this one, each intensity will be 17 percent. So this one you can see this is 1 and this is 1. So here this is separation, this separation or this separation is identical. This is for this PT coupling and, and this one and this one for this PT coupling. So this is satellite peaks are there and if you just look into this one, this is 17 percent and then this is 17 percent and then this is 66 percent. So this is how you can write satellite peaks equidistance from the central one that is for I equals 0 species isotope. So this is how you can see and the magnitude I have given the 1J PTP coupling is very large when they are cis 4000 to it can go even up to 6 to 7000 and usually when two phosphors are trans to each other PTP coupling will be less than 2 hertz. 2000 hertz or it may be 2400. That means if any isomeration is there or if you have cis compound or trans compound you should be able to tell immediately simply by looking into phosphorus platinum coupling. So now here for example this compound is taken bis triphenyl phosphine ruthenium CPCL. This compound was prepared using I showed you the method and when it is reacted with uh, a bisphosphine all possible. So we got all the products as a mixture and how to assign this one well, simply 31 PNMR can tell you what are the products you have in the mixture. So for example this will show a singlet where this one show a doublet for uh, these two. And, and a triplet for this one and then this would show a doublet for this one and, and these two will couple with this one, it shows a triplet and then this would show a triplet and each triplet line will be split into a doublet. And then if you look into the intensity, you can also get the information in what ratios these compounds were made and also if you know the reaction condition whether in case if there is a problem in separating these three, you should think of separate reaction method for isolation of these compounds by looking into the uh, stoichiometry and reaction condition. For example, here RUCL bond is broken that means the, the yields of these compound can be enhanced by using a polar solvent. Whereas if you use non-polar solvent you can retain RUCL bond and simply you can replace 2 triphenyl phosphine with the chelate ligand. Here what happens the entropy is that 
driving force for this one. So, that you can analyze using spectrum and also you can understand the reaction condition and accordingly you can change the reaction condition to make the desired compounds. I will show you the spectrum here, this is how the mixture looks like. The one compound where we have simple chelation or an identical one you are getting as I mentioned here, you have very nicely you can interpret the data for three type of compounds we have. This one will show a singlet and this will show a complicated three lines are there one and then this will show a doublet and a triplet these two and whereas this one is a doublet for this one and then this is uh, a doublet of doublet here and then this one show a triplet and each triplet line is split into doublet. So, you can very nicely interpret and understand what kind of products you got in your own reaction. And now, if you just look into n-butyl lithium, it has a cubane structure. For example, two spectra are given at 195 K, okay, it is static structure. Here, three lithiums are connected to each carbon, a cubane structure is there. Just recall my teaching in my you know main group chemistry lecture if you have looked into or you can just go to my lectures and look into it the structure. So, 3 lithiums are connected to tertiary carbon here. So, this one will show 7 lines here because lithium has I equals 1. So, if you use 3 Ni plus 1, 3 into 2 plus 1 7 lines it shows. But on the other hand when the fractional process is there we have 4 equivalent lithiums are there. In cubane 4 alternate carbons are occupied by lithium and methyl group. So, we have totally uh, 4 lithium atoms are there all are interacting with carbon because of fractional process in that case we get 9 lines. So, very nicely you can interpret the data. So, uh, this is about similarly you can look into this one and uh, you can just see I will stop now. Uh, I shall proceed for IR spectroscopy for few minutes. So, infra Red spectroscopy is a vital tool to chemists wishing to identify what functional groups exist in unknown samples. The light our eyes see is but a small part of a broad spectrum of electromagnetic radiation in the visible region. On the immediate high energy side of the visible spectrum lies the ultraviolet and on the low energy side is the infrared one. So, you can see here this is the range. So, with a wavelength range of 2500 to 16000 nanometer the infrared region is capable of revealing information not easily uncovered through basic means. And what are those things? So, proton energies associated with the infrared region are not large enough to excite electrons, but they are still strong enough to induce vibrational excitation of covalently bonded atoms and groups. So, when you look into a bond, so covalent bonds are not rigid sticks but rods but are like spring that can be rotated if the single bond is there or they can be stretched like this or they can be bent. This is how with uh, by simply absorbing energy in the infrared region this will be the stretching is there, bending is there or rotation is there. So, this wide variety of vibrational motions is characteristic to a molecules component atoms. All organic and inorganic compounds will absorb infrared radiation that corresponds in energy to these vibrations and infrared spectrometers permit chemists to obtain absorption spectra of compounds that are a unique reflections of their molecular structure. So, now let us look into a typical spectrum I have given here and this is for formaldehyde. So, IR readings are inverted compared with the UV visible spectra, UV spectra you can see like this is coming, but it looks like inverted one with sharp peaks while that one that did absorb a significant amount would be towards the bottom. If they are absorbing they will be falling down those do not absorb will go flat like that. Each peak dips on the graph represents various bond characteristics and because most functional groups have specific bonds they can be readily identified. You have given the groups and also corresponding stretching frequency here. Formaldehyde what is important is ketone carbonyl group is there and shows around 1750 centimeter minus. So, this how this is the inverse one we are not considering this one. So, this how it looks like. So, now how it helps it is very very important in carbonyl complexes infrared and it is very vital in structural determination also by simply looking into the number of bands in the CO stretching region. If the number is consistent with that provided by the selection rule of a particular point group may be assigned to that molecule. And also for CO 
around 2000 centimeter inverse is very very important. Relationship between the molecular structure of a compound and the activity of stretching modes can also be understood and analyzed to arrive at the structure of a molecule. For substituted carbonyl complexes, we can think of assigning point groups considering the local symmetry of the metal and the carbonyl groups provided ligands of spherical symmetry or by considering the symmetry of the molecule as a whole. So, we have two options before we assign uh, look into stretching frequencies. For example, let us look into the example shown here CpMnCO3 it has C3V symmetry and CpVCO4 it has C4V symmetry and if you just look into this one arene MCO3 it has again C3V symmetry. So, all of them show two stretching frequencies for carbon monoxide and both Cp and C6H6 arene are axially symmetrical with respect to these point group. That means, you can rotate through that one okay? passing through the middle of uh, your Cp group or benzene you can do a rotation. And in case if we replace arene group with say aniline or something or thiophene what happens symmetry will be lowered then the symmetry of whole molecule has to be considered. So, you should not consider local symmetry of metal you have to consider the whole symmetry in that case what happens we will see three stretching frequencies. Electron distribution okay, of course, electron distribution I have discussed in length how a pair of electrons and carbon will go to metal through sigma bonding and metal T2G electrons will be transferred to pi star through back bonding. So, depending upon to what extent electrons are moving from metal to ligand stretching frequency will vary accordingly. So, this is the typical bond explanation. So, this is sigma bonding and this is pi bonding. These two modes of bonding are mutually reinforcing and strengthening metal to carbon bond this is called synergy effect or synergistic effect. Charge removal through pi bonding leads to more extensive sigma bonding while charge donated donated through sigma bonding thus facilitates further back bonding. So, that means it is give and take because of sigma donation you see carbonyl become electron deficient and metal become rich it gives through back bonding with back bonding what happens metal become poor and carbon monoxide become rich. So, sigma bonding will be stronger. So, both of these opposite direction bonding strengthens each other as a result what happens we call it as synergistic effect. So, eventually metal to carbon bond is strengthened and carbon to oxygen bond is weakened. So, to what extent this is weakened or strengthened depending upon how much electrons are coming from metal to pi star of carbon monoxide. So, that is a measure of the overall ele electron density at the metal center and if you are looking into the combined or mixed ligand complexes what is the share of other back bonding ligands and how they compare in terms of their back bonding capabilities. For example, while it is not necessary to remember all of the peaks for each functional group learning a few key characteristics will be enough to answer 99 percent of all IR questions. In the reading of formaldehyde spectrum we have a lot of peaks here we should not focus on those things we have to focus on only few things like C stretching, CO stretching where it is and also whether we have CH3 or stretching or any other. So, these are very important uh, while characterizing this we call it as fingerprint region. So, the complexity of infrared spectra in, in the 1450 and to 600 centimeter region makes it very difficult we get lot of peaks in this region. It difficult to assign all the absorption bands and because of unique pattern found there it is often called the fingerprint region. It is not necessary to remember any peaks in this region as they will not help you determine any significant functional groups and not uh, any significant functional groups come in that region either. So, absorption bands in the 4000 to 1450 are important are usually due to stretching vibrations of diatomic units and this is sometimes called the group frequency region. It is this region which is most practical to identifying groups some notable frequencies that should be remembered I have shown here. You can see alcohols and acids OH group is there in this range it is there for amines NH this will be this range and for alkanes CH okay, they come here narrow peak and ketones acids. CO group will be here and for triple bonds C, C or C N it will be important. If acetonitril binding is there or acetylene binding is there these are very important. So, one thing to keep in mind about IR spectra is that it can only tell you whether a group is present or not. It will not tell you how many groups or how large the molecule is one should remember it is just qualitative not quantitative. For example, if you see a sharp peak at 17 
50 centimeter minus 1, it will tell us that there is some sort of a carbonyl group, it can be ketone, ester or part of an acid etc. or sometimes it can be metal carbon monoxide with extensive back bonding or it may be bridging two metal centers, but it will not tell us perhaps there are two or three ketone groups present. So, it will not tell you whether how many such groups are present. As I mentioned it is qualitative not quantitative with this in mind and using only the selected few important peaks we have to remember. So, we can say easily or we can guess what functional groups are present and thus identify the molecules from a few selections. In the following spectrum if you see we should focus our attention on 3000 and 1750 one can most easily notice a sharp peak around 1700 easily. So, th that means you can conclude that there is a CO group thus it is most likely a ketone or a aldehyde this range also tell you. Secondly there is no broad group or a sharp group around 3000 so that means there is no OH or NH. So, there is however a sharp peak just below 3000 which most likely corresponds to alkane CH, CH2 and or CH3 bonds, it could be part of the aldehydic CH bond as well. So, that means if the choices are there like 2 methyl cyclobutanol, 3 methyl 2 butanone and 2 chloropentonoic acid, if the options are this, it should be very clear that we will recognize this as 3 methyl 2 butanone which has both necessary CO band and, a, and it lacks a OH bond as well. So, immediately we can pick the right one among these three to say that this spectrum belongs to this molecule here. It is that it is easy. So, now let us look into metal carbonyls. Metal carbonyls with nitrogen donors you can make a maximum you can replace a maximum of three carbonyls I mentioned. So, now if you see here uh, free carbon monoxide is around 2133 and metal hexacarbonyls will show around 2000 and increase in negative charge on metal is observed by new CO changes. For example, you can see here. So, it is a positive charge is there and it is here neutral and it is negative charge is there. So, when you negative charge is there more electron density is there as a result stretching frequency will drop more electron density goes to the pi star and here it is a midway 2000 whereas here is a positively charged. So, less electron density goes from the metal as a result stretching frequency is more. So, we should be able to analyze the, the electron density that resides on metal very easily by looking into the stretching frequencies. And of course, the two extreme cases of metal carbonyls is shown here very strengthened and very weak and very strong here CO group and here of course, metal to carbon strength increases in this order. Okay, this information very nicely comes from IR spectroscopy. So, pi acceptor ability of CO in metal hexacarbonyls will tell you that it can take anywhere between each carbon monoxide can take anywhere between 0.1 to 1.2 electron pairs to its pi star orbitals. So, new CO decreases as more and more groups are substituted that means more and more groups are substituted with non back bonding ligands. In that case what happens the, the responsibility falls on uh, few carbon monoxide left on the metal as a result the stretching frequency decreases. So, complete substitution of CO from MCO6 has been achieved only with strong pi acceptor ligands such as PF3. The best competitors for CO are phosphates especially having strong electron withdrawing groups or electronegative groups on phosphorus. So, advantage with phosphines is coordination properties can be readily altered, but you cannot do with carbon monoxide. So, among no pi acceptor ligands, so example diglime, ammonia and all those things, if you want to know what is diglime, it is an ether something like this and how to spell it? You can say diethylene glycol dimethyl ether. Many reactions you come across diglime, you should be able to write the structure and you can tell it is diethylene glycol dimethyl ether. So, mixed metal carbonyls with one or more diglime like ligands can also show some trends in the stretching frequencies. For example, if diglime is there that shows higher stretching frequency than having simple di in here and also when we have these things sigma orbits for back bonding decreases and then relative sigma donor ability of above donor atoms may be estimated from the stabilities of their addition complexes especially with aluminum trichloride is a Lewis acid. The order of donating ability it also follows this order and this order. It is about only back bonding. This has to do nothing with stretching frequencies. So, now I have given uh, depending upon the type of point group possessed by these molecules and how many IR active modes are there. For example, MCO5L is there, you can see 3 uh, CO bands, and if you have something like the cis, you can see 4, and if you have trans, you can see 1, 
and I, I can just go through this one. I have given for octahedral geometry and I have given for trigonal bipyramidal geometry as well. And also I have mentioned position of carbon monoxide and also the point group here. Just you can look into it. And now for example, you take hexacarbonyl and if you uh, replace 1, 3 and you get a facial, in that case we get only 2 provided all ligands are identical. And then in case what happens if you have 1 MCOFIL, you get 3 stretching frequencies and if you have trans, we get only 1 stretching frequency. Similarly, if you have cis here, we can get 4 stretching frequencies and if you have something like this, here we can get 3 stretching frequencies meridional. So something in the same way when we go for pentacarbonyl and if you start replacing carbon monoxide with L, the number of stretching frequencies would uh, be shown in this figure here. So 3 active, here 4 active are there and in this case CS, so all of them are unique, you can see 3 different and same thing here and same thing here. With this, so let me conclude about IR spectroscopy and MR spectroscopy and overall whatever I wanted to tell as a part of this course, probably in my last lecture I said try to consolidate and summer up and also if anything is left little bit I will highlight about that one and conclude my lecture. So that would be the 60th lecture. So thank you for your kind attention and, and I have to go through quickly in case of uh, IR and NMR because of lack of time of course but everything is there in the slides and also I have spoken already please listen to what I say and also try to look into all the slides in detail and try to understand the chemistry behind these things. Thank you so much.